So how is it that a guy editing from his laptop in his bedroom was able to get a documentary to trend on Netflix twice? That's what I wanna talk about in this video. Spoiler alert, it requires sacrificing your firstborn child and joining a secret cult. Totally worth it though. Earlier this year, my latest film, The Minimalists Less Is Now, was released to Netflix. And there it is. It tells the story of two guys named Josh and Ryan, who after climbing the corporate ladder for a decade, decided to give it all up to live a simple life. The film explores a culture that's become addicted to stuff and the future challenges we face on our pursuit of happiness. And it shows a path towards how to redefine life on your own terms. Whether you're curious about how it all works or you've got ambitions to make a film of your own, I wanna rewind the clock and show you the exact steps that it took me to go from a wedding videographer to a Netflix director to show you that one, it's possible, and two, pants are optional. That's an important part. But like not, not in public, like not when you're out in public. You should definitely wear pants publicly. I'm just talking about when you're editing at home by yourself. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, more on them later. So to really understand how I got my most recent film deal, we'll have to go back to the beginning. In 2014, after years as a freelance filmmaker working on local television commercials and bar mitzvah videos, I was tired of all the groupies, money, and fame that those projects were bringing me, and so I decided to take on a bigger challenge to make my first feature-length documentary. So I teamed up with a couple of strangers who soon became friends named Josh and Ryan to tell a story that all three of us had seen taking hold in America, how people all over the country were pushing back against consumerism, ditching their stuff to live more simple lives. The word that everybody was using to describe this movement was minimalism. So we called the documentary Minimalism. It's hard to really put into words the amount of doubt that I was going through at this time. This was such an overwhelming project for me. Up until this point, I had only made videos that were three to five minutes long, and now I was setting out to make a feature documentary over one hour long. I'd never done it before, and I personally knew no one else who had. We certainly had no expectations to get this thing on any major streaming platform. We simply wanted to make a film that we believed in and that we thought would help people. Also, I heard that documentary filmmakers get lots of groupies. What can I say? I couldn't help myself. <laughs> that wasn't true. Um, somebody lied to me and I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. But really for me, this was a chance to do something really ambitious, to do something that I was equally terrified and excited to do. It was one of those projects that I just couldn't say no to. And so that was all I needed, the ambitions of making my first documentary to take the first step. So equipped with a Canon C300, a light kit, and my camera bag, we hit the road documenting the minimalist story and interviewing people along the way. Okay, so I'm Leo Babauta, and I'm the creator of Zen Habits, and I write about simplicity and minimalism and mindfulness. I learned during production that there's only so much that you can plan for. Eventually, you just need to get your hands dirty and learn along the way. We filmed and edited minimalism off and on for two years, investing just over $80,000, $84,919.85 to be exact. A tiny budget for a feature documentary, but a lot of money for us. The reason we were able to keep the budget so small was that I was the director, cinematographer, and editor. About 95% of our shoots were a one-man crew. Also, I was able to call in some favors from filmmaker friends to help us get finished with a legit color grade and sound mix. So I'm not gonna be able to get into all of the details of this project because then this video would end up being twice as long as the documentary that I just put out. But suffice to say that this project was incredibly challenging. I wanna make that clear. There were so many days when I felt frustrated, lost. I didn't know where the project was going. There were days when I truly hated this movie. And then of course there were days where I felt excited, I felt passionate, and I really loved the project what I was working on. I came to realize that making any big creative project like this was just as much about the skills required to get the job done as it was actually having the determination to finish, having the grit and the perseverance to push through the hard times. And so after two years, we'd finally finished the film and were ready to release it except we really had no major plan to release the film. Josh and Ryan had a blog where they wrote about simple living. They had built up a pretty sizable audience online of a few hundred thousand readers. And because of their audience size, Josh and Ryan did have an agent. And that agent was able to get us into contact with Netflix to whom we shared the film. And that's when we heard back from Netflix. And they said that our film wasn't a good fit. 
And so did every other streaming platform that we sent it to. Rejection after rejection came through, and it was clear that we had no distribution partner, we had no streaming deal, we had a film. And so with one out of three, we decided to do the only thing that we could do. We uploaded it to Vimeo, iTunes, and Amazon and declared to the world that our film was officially released. And the response took us by surprise. Josh and Ryan's audience helped to kickstart our launch well beyond our expectations. The first week, it hit number one on iTunes for documentaries. So this is where Netflix enters the picture again. Truthfully, I don't know a lot about the back-end negotiations that took place because I wasn't a part of those conversations. My job was to work on the creative side, get that film made, and then it was up to my production partners as well as their agent to make the right connections to be able to get in this film in front of as many eyes as possible. And so it came to my understanding later on that a big reason why Netflix decided to license the film was because of the independent success that we had. Going to number one on iTunes for documentaries, having the success and the social chatter that we did online really helped uh, us in negotiating that deal. Anyway, so Netflix licensed the rights to the film and on December 15th, 2016, it went live. And things got kind of crazy from there. Netflix doesn't release their numbers, but the film quickly began to trend as millions of people began talking about the film online. There was a good deal of luck involved in finding the right connections to getting our foot in the door, but the truth is that that door never would have opened if we didn't make a really great film to start with. And so if you're an aspiring filmmaker, there's two pieces of advice that I would give you as you begin to create your first film. One, focus first on making the absolute best film that you can. Control everything that you can and put everything you have into production. Oftentimes, the actual production isn't as expensive as the post-production cost down the road. And so if you're able to get as far as you can to create a trailer to eventually pitch to networks and potentially investors, then that's a really great path to take. And the second piece of advice that I'd say is to partner up with people who have other skills than you, skills that you don't have. Josh and Ryan were talented producers and they also brought with them an audience. This audience helped us to have the confidence to, to know that we would likely make our money back from the money we invested into the film initially. And we'd also get a return back on all the time that we put into this film. And so even if we didn't get a deal at the end of the day, we still would have been able to release this independently and likely make our money back. At least we would be able to break even. It was also so helpful for me to be a part of a team, to have that accountability to deliver day after day. Awesome, nice to meet you. This is Matt. Nice He's Matt. How are you? He, he has a big camera with me. It's not that big. I had tried and failed to start films by myself in the past, but having a team kept me going. You might think that making a successful documentary automatically lines you up to making another, but that simply is not true, as much as I wish it was. Sure, it did help us. We did now have the experience as well as some really important connections, but we were a long ways away from making our second film. The story of how we got our most recent film onto Netflix is a different story entirely, and one that taught me a lot about how to successfully pitch your ideas and also how to push through failure. Before I go on, I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is one of the few companies that I've decided to partner with this year because I've been such a huge fan of their platform over the past few years. I started using Squarespace as a way to show off my filmmaking reel. And eventually I built my personal website on it, then my podcast landing page, and other odd projects like gettherockonmattspodcast.com. I've used them for website after website because they have beautiful templates that make it so easy to get started. All you need to do is click, drag, and drop. Squarespace has everything you need to start a blog and to monetize your work, collect donations from your fans, and even create members-only content. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash mattdiavella to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I've left a link down in the description below. So the follow-up idea to our first documentary, Minimalism, was a live talk. We would film The Minimalists over a few live shows sharing their story of how they went from suit and tie corporate guys to minimalists. It was an idea that was only supposed to take about four months to make. In the end, it ended up taking over four years. Let me explain. It started out very run and gun just after our first film launched. Tomorrow I'm going out on tour with Josh and Ryan from The Minimalists again. We don't know where this is heading. We, we don't know exactly what we're gonna create from this, but I know that we're all just incredibly excited to get back out on the road again, to start filming again, and, and to see what we can put together. 
I joined The Minimalist on tour and we bounced from one live show to another for months. Yeah, so we, we just got off the plane. We're going to baggage check right now. We were thinking about stitching these talks together, but we didn't really have a plan and it showed. We were trying to match the same production level of Netflix comedy specials with a two person crew and no budget. It just wasn't working out. So we went back to the drawing board. So that's when we decided to put some more money down. We invested about $40,000 into production to rent out a space of our own to find a unique environment to put on a talk. It wasn't gonna be in an auditorium. We wanted to elevate it and make it completely unique to tell their story in the right way. We did location scouting around LA, checking out empty warehouses and production studios that might fit the vibe we were going for. We eventually chose this warehouse space and got to work. And it was way more work than I ever anticipated. We had no experience in live shows or set design, but we plowed forward. So we'll have the stage here and we're gonna fill up with 300 people around it, trying to make it an a intimate, a intimate event. And then uh, from there, you know, we have chairs all around. We'll have the cameras. We've got 24 hours to put the entire production set up in here. All right, so today is February 10th, 2018, and we are about to shoot a talk today. We've got a crew of about 18 people on the production crew. We've got six ushers, five security guards. We've got five cameras on them. There, there's thousands and thousands of decisions, both small and large, that go into a project like this to make sure that it comes across in the way that you want it to, that it has the look that you want it to, has the feel, the tone, the sound is right, the audience has high energy. Josh and Ryan deliver on their message. There's so much that's at stake when shooting a project like this, because you got one day. If it doesn't work out today, it's not like we can just pick it up and reshoot tomorrow. So, a little bit of pressure. A lot of pressure. We decided to shoot two shows back to back with over 200 people per show. And we ran into some huge issues during the day of the shoot. My favorite among them, we didn't have enough bathrooms. There were about 400 people spread out over two shows. And you know how many bathrooms we had? We had one. <laughs> We had one bathroom. <laughs> there was lines wrapped around the warehouse for the two shows that put us about 35 to 45 minutes behind schedule for each show. And that made me stress out like freaking crazy. Another thing we overlooked is that we should have done a dress rehearsal run through, but in an effort to save money, we decided to just wing it on the night of. As a result, Josh and Ryan's wardrobe didn't match the vision I had or their personalities for that matter. Overall though, the production quality just didn't meet our standards. There's a reason that stand-up specials cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make. Production design, location design, and event management are really expensive. Our DIY approach fell flat. Today's the day. We'll see how it goes. It didn't go well. After months and months of planning, filming, and editing, we finally had a film. And it was mediocre. <laughs> It was, it was not a very good film. It was very slow. Uh, I think our ability to create a set and production design just wasn't very good, <laughs> uh, to put it mildly. I take full responsibility for that. Uh, we had an amazing production crew that helped put this together. Everybody in the cast and crew were just awesome. I think it was just my lack of experience in, in putting on live shows and directing them that really led to this being so mediocre and boring. And so we realized that we really had to go back to the drawing board. The structure was there. It was a live talk meshed with some pretty compelling documentary cutaways, exploring Josh and Ryan's backstory, but the execution sucked. It just wasn't good enough. But we still had a film that we believed in. We thought that the idea had a lot of potential, especially after seeing the success of minimalism. And so at that point, we decided to pitch it to Netflix. We thought if we had the right budget and we were able to correct some of those mistakes that we made the first time around, we'd have a really successful film. And so we got started on the pitch. Using the best footage that we had from our earlier shoots, I cut together a tight two minute trailer. For me, it all started with one question. How might your life be better with less? 
Then my producer, Josh, put together a 16-page pitch document sharing the vision for what we wanted to do with the film moving forward. And we had the full 50-minute film we'd already created that could at least show the concept. In my opinion, this was probably the weakest part of the pitch. I was a little bit worried that they might see the worst in the film instead of seeing the possibility. If you're lucky enough to get in the door at Netflix, they don't have any set requirements for how you pitch them. You pitch them however you think will best represent your idea. And when it came to our own pitch, I think that the strongest uh, elements to it were the trailer, which helped to really show them the tone, the pace, the idea that we wanted to get across with the film and to the pitch deck, which helped to give them confidence in our future vision for the film. Now, we were showing them essentially a failed film, <laughs> a film that uh, wasn't very good. And so we really needed to clarify how we were going to be able to turn around and make it a much better film. And they took a few months to think about it, to share it with different team members. They came back and said, yes. And from that point on, it became a Netflix original, which meant that they were funding it up front and they were gonna be team members along the way, which was absolutely invaluable for this project. They gave so much amazing guidance and direction and helpful tips and resources that really helped to make this film what it ended up being. At that point, we wasted no time getting to work. I spent weeks diving into the script to rewrite and reorganize everything into something that felt more like a film than a talk. Then we began production. I enlisted my friend and brilliant cinematographer, Chris Newhart, to help with the visuals for the film. We decided to film the main monologues in the same warehouse as before, but with a different vision. No live audience, direct to camera, and those differences alone are pretty dramatic. If it doesn't work out today, it's not like we can just pick it up and reshoot tomorrow. I guess that actually wasn't true. Some of the most fun scenes to shoot were the recreations. How you feeling, bro? What's up? How are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling pretty good. good. We are setting up for the first shot right now. Do you see the first shot we got? This is a reenactment scene. Basically the next four days, all we're shooting is nothing but reenactments. Um, getting a feel for what Josh and Ryan's lives were like before they got into minimalism. My favorite piece of advice I ever got from another filmmaker is that if your story doesn't change along the way, then you're not listening. There were many things that we planned at the beginning of pre-production that needed to be adjusted later on, like our original intro. Initially, I had planned to start the film with this one minute sketch. I want you to take a second and imagine your life with more. More clothes, more cars, more big screen TVs and houses and devices and every material possession you've ever wanted. Now you might be asking yourself more, but I've already got a lot of stuff and it's not really making me happy. Well, maybe that's because you haven't thought about the benefits of even more. Even more? That's right, even more. You know that void deep inside you? That lonely, sunken feeling that never seems to go away? You're saying that could be filled with even more stuff, right? Yup. But hey, what do we know? We're just two highly successful middle managers who have it all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what could go wrong if you just acquired a little bit more? Cut! Right. What'd you think? Right. Could do this bad news. Okay. But once we got into post-production, we felt that there were some problems with it. Cut. One, it doesn't hook the viewer in with a compelling or interesting question, something that helps them to realize what this film is about, to lead them in the right direction. Instead, this film kind of leaves you wondering what the hell this movie is going to be about. Number two, starting with The Minimalists, with Josh and Ryan, is good and it works if the audience had already seen minimalism. But we were trying to attract an even wider audience with this film, and so we needed to open it up to, to really hook people before we actually introduce the main characters of the film. And I think the third reason it, that, that it didn't work out is that sometimes things work on paper, sometimes things sound funny in your head, and then when you put it into practice, it maybe doesn't follow through. It maybe doesn't have the right tone. And, and maybe that kind of sketch would have worked for a particular kind of film, but when you watch it in context with the rest of the film, I just don't think it fit well. You can watch the film on Netflix. Let me know in the comments if you think I made the right decision about the opener. One of the biggest problems we ran into was the structure of the film itself. Initially, it was meant to be split into part one and part two. In the first half of the film, Josh tells his story, and in the second half, Ryan tells his. We even set up both Josh and Ryan's stages in the same warehouse at the same time and had Josh hand off the story with a massive dolly shot. 
setting up both of these stages, constructing the dolly, planning all of these shots out took so much time to put together. But once we got into post-production and through the first edits, it was unanimous amongst everybody on our team that this film would be much more compelling if we were able to interweave the story of The Minimalist together. There is still so much work to be done in the edit. There's so many problems that need to be solved. There's so many things that um, will be changed about the film, things that will be cut, things that will be added. It's so difficult to cut scenes that took hours of planning and filming and the help of an amazing production crew, but it's absolutely vital that you do not get married to any of your ideas. Much like the idea of minimalism itself, you must do an honest evaluation and decide what is essential and what's not. Now these are just a couple examples of the kind of problems and considerations that you need to make when creating a film like this. You obviously have an idea of what you wanna do going into production, but once you're in post-production, you can't lie to yourself. You can't just be so stubborn that you decide that everything that you did originally was gonna be exactly as the film ends up because that's almost never the case, at least not in my experience. So I don't know, if somebody else has a different experience, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Once we got through our first few versions of the film, we got back to production. This was around the time that COVID hit, so filming was delayed, but eventually we were able to film 20 remote interviews with everyday minimalists. These were people who had watched the first film and decided to simplify their lives. It gave a richer and more diverse context for how minimalism can be applied to anyone's life. And then we found five experts to help us dig further into the problem and talk about consumer culture as a whole. So whenever you have different partners and, and team members, you're always gonna be going through different iterations and versions of the film. And since I directed it and edited the film, I was doing a lot of work by myself, kind of headphones on, head down. And then we would get to the point where we would have version one, version two, version three. I'd share that with the team. I'd share it with our internal team of our production crew and pr uh, production partners. And then we'd share it with Netflix's team and along the way, we just got so much amazing feedback and, and perspective. So much uh, of this process is getting fresh eyes and getting people to see things that you don't see, to really sit in the, the shoes of the audience, to, to feel what they might experience when watching the film. And so that's why you go through a process of one iteration to eventually 30. And after four years and three different attempts, we had a film that we were proud of and ready to release. Making this film really taught me that you should never give up on an idea before you've exhausted all options. It would have been easy to settle for good enough, to be okay with a mediocre film and release it independently. But when you really care about the craft, when you truly want to make an impact, there's something deep inside of you that calls you to push forward. And so that's how I was able to get both of my films onto Netflix. As you can see, there is no straight line to success or getting a film on a major streaming platform. It requires a lot of failures. It requires many, many years of dedicating yourself to the craft. But if it's something that you really dream of doing, I'm here to say that it's absolutely possible. And it's also never guaranteed. So even for me, moving forward, I'm gonna be making future films. I, I have no guarantee that I'm gonna be able to do it again, or at least to put it on a major streaming platform. If I do it again, I might even release it independently. Um, if you are interested in learning about the future films I make, which by the way, won't be about minimalism, I think that I've covered that topic well enough up until this point. Uh, if you wanna find out more about those future projects, you can subscribe to my newsletter at mattdiavella.com. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you got a lot out of it and I'll see you down in the comments.